really fortunate to have here today uh, my colleague, Professor Marty Hurst, um, who is a professor in the School of Information at Berkeley um, and also affiliated with the Computer Science Department where she has a BA and a PhD. Her primary research interests are user interfaces for search engines, information visualization, natural language processing, and improving MOOCs. Marty wrote the first book on search user interfaces. Um, and I would go on. She has many, many honors. She was most recently named as a fellow in the ACM and has received NSF Career Award and IBM Faculty Award, two Google Research Awards, an Okawa Foundation Fellowship, three Excellence in Teaching Awards, and a PI for more than 3.5 million in research grants. Um, I really am delighted to welcome Marty here. Join me. In Okay, hi everybody. Hope you're having a good morning. Yes, so I was glad to hear an allusion to visualization in the earlier discussions. That's what I'll, I was asked to talk about, so I'll be talking about today. This is a brand new talk, so bear with me. It might be a little rough around the edges. It's actually a bit of a research talk. So uh, the title I've chosen is Uncovering Best Practices in Exploratory Data Analysis. And I will spend some time saying what is exploratory data analysis. And this is joint work with my PhD student, Sarah Alska, and actually with a seminar I'm running with uh, MIMS students, our master's, in-person master's program this semester. And actually with the, the students in, in, to some degree that in my uh, regular InfoViz course as well. So why do we do information visualization? Why don't we just do statistics? And as my much more insightful colleagues like, like Stu Card will say, it is to gain insight. That's the primary reason one should use visualization is to help gain insight where other techniques will not suffice. And that is where the visual system will reveal information that cannot be gained from other techniques. That's not always the case. The visual system is not always the solution. So I'm not saying that that's the case. But sometimes it is. And there's some classic examples um, so one that I started using that's different than the standard one people use uh, because I recently gave a talk to a bunch of geneticists is a, a very simple one. If you ever had chemistry, which probably everyone had at least in high school, is there's this very simple molecular formulas like C4H4, which we can write with nice little characters. But this actually has two different structural representations. This is back in the 2D world before we got, we were able to do the 3D stuff. This was what I learned in high school. And these mean quite different things depending on the layout. You get butane versus isobutane from this same formula. But this would kind of be the equivalent of what we might write in text, in, a, in line and text, versus structural formula. And these have quite different chemical properties. So that's, just looking at it on the page, you're getting quite different information. It's a very classic uh, example that's in every information visualization textbook, which is the Anscombe number set, where you have four simple lists of numbers, XY pairs. And <laughs> the idea here is if you just look at the numbers, you can't really, the pairs, you can't tell much about them. If you look at their summary statistics, they're all the same. They have the same mean. They have the same standard deviation. If you do a regression, you get the same regression line and you get the same R-square statistic. So they're kind of the same sets of numbers according to standard basic summary statistics that, that confirmatory statistics would sort of say these are the same, but if you plot them on a XY axis, they look radically different. And one would argue that they have different behaviors. And so this is an example where looking at the numbers gives you a different insight. And so this is really old. This is from 1973. So <coughs> talking about this isn't new, but 
what happened, my understanding is, and I wasn't there at the time, but what happened is that people used to kind of when play with small data sets and think about the numbers and then sort of more powerful statistics came along, took over and everyone just did these more statistical techniques and forgot about exploring the data and said, no, you think of it, figure out the distribution you have. Is it a Poisson? Is it a Gaussian? You do these statistical techniques and people stopped looking at the data and computers came along and really reinforced the standard statistical techniques. Now more recently we got really powerful computers and really powerful software and I mean really recently. Now our current students don't re realize that this is super recent and when I first started teaching at Bovis in 1998, the software didn't work well, everything crashed, you could barely run you know, research software, and the students all complained, and anything exploratory barely worked and it was really slow. But in the last few years, you can load up software, it will load a lot of data, it will let you explore and look at data in all sorts of crazy ways, very easily, without crashing, without dying, in very exciting ways, lots of data really fast. And so of course, because it's there, students think it's always been like that, which is false. Uh, it's very recent, it's very new, and we don't really know how to do it well. We collectively, this exploratory sort of data analysis. So we went from, you would explore really small data sets like this, to you don't explore it, you just do statistical analysis in these sort of preset ways, to now we explore lots and lots of data really quickly, uh, but we don't have not, for, let alone the pedagogy, we don't really have the understanding as a community how to do it well, but we do have the tools. So that's kind of what this talks about. So when we do visualization, there's data analysis and there's visualization of the data as sort of related things. Uh, when I teach this, I talk about there's two reasons to visualize primarily. One is to do the analysis to gain understanding as an analyst, and the other is to present the results to other people so that they have understanding. And this is an important dichotomy that we cover a lot in my class, and these are not the same. The final thing might look similar, there might be bar charts at, at some point, but what the information is that you're showing is <coughs> different in these different cases. But what's really important is the process by which you go through when you're doing visualization or data analysis for analysis versus for presentation. And one is really more about the process and the other is more about the end result. And it's very important to know which you're doing and what I'm really talking about today is visualization and analysis for analysis. For you to understand, for an, an analyst to understand what a data set is about or what a pro solve a problem and <coughs> looking in the early stages of data analysis. So before talking more about exploratory data analysis, I want to contrast that with the other thing. <laughs> what is not exploratory data analysis, which is more like looking at some data where you kind of understand what it's about and you want to present it to other people. So in my information visualization course, it actually has four units, four conceptual units. I'm not going to go through them all. And with, within each unit, the students also learn four tools, which I'm also not going to go through. But I want to talk about one of the units. And what we do in that unit is uh, we learn how to use a tool and we learn proper uh, principles for visualizing standard graphics. And then the students have, to, I give them a data set and they have to use those principles and use a tool to visualize some data. And then I tell them that this data set is going to be objectively evaluated. How do I do that? I show their visualizations to people and I make the people answer the questions. I don't judge it. People try to answer the questions and if they get the answers wrong, then that means the visualization wasn't very good. Don't blame me, <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> That's proper, that's usability, right? If people can't use your system, it's your fault, don't blame me. So that's, that's the right way to do things. So objectively evaluated assignment. And so, oh my goodness, oh, that slide's just in the wrong place. Okay, let's just forget that. So here, so I gave them some data and I didn't tell them what the questions would be, the students, uh, but these were what the questions were. Uh, and I divided it up so that there wasn't too much data, but there were questions like, there was, this was really boring business data, which department spent over budget for the first half of the year and under budget for the second half? Uh, this is what it tests, seeing a trend across time by department. Which department was over budget in every month of the year except November? Test, seeing a trend across time. Which department was the most under budget? Yeah, blah, 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 and it tests different principles. And here were some other questions. So 
they had to design a visualization that would be able to answer a lot of different questions, so it was quite a challenging task. And again, I didn't give them the questions in advance. I told them the types of questions, right? So then, and look at the huge variety of designs that did well, that did the best. They weren't all the same. And that's another point, is there's not one solution that works well. It's a wide space. But um, these different designs did well. There's line graphs, there's bar charts, there's this really innovative heat map that somebody just dissed. But actually, people, um, <laughs> people uh, did quite well. Um, it's true it wouldn't work well for the colorblind. So there's, well, actually, it's not necessarily true. Uh, actually, I just had a lecture in my class yesterday from one of the world's experts on color. And it turns out that because of the uh, lightness values of red versus green, you actually, colorblind people can make this distinction depending on that. So um, it's, color is very tricky. But anyway, there's ways to test to see if they, if colored by people could see it. But anyways, a lot of different var variety. And, you know, I don't have to judge this because people can answer the questions they couldn't. So that was really awesome. It really makes grading easy. Actually, I still, give them, I still give them feedback independent of what the objectives said. But the bottom line was this is not about exploration. This was straightforward. Uh, the answers are already there. Somebody already did the work to get this business data. And this is about presentation and for interpretability. All right. So in contrast to this, if my slide will move forward. Okay, slide. Hmm, I guess we like this slide for some reason. Oh, I know. It was, that's something else. All right. What is exploratory data analysis? What, what's the difference? All right. So John Tukey is considered kind of the, maybe not the father, but kind of the thought leader behind this, and he was doing this in the 60s, and he used graph paper, and I actually had the privilege of knowing him because he consulted around the valley when he was in his 80s, drinking his prune juice, and <laughs> literally, I spent many um, afternoons in the cafeteria with him, and so he was very thoughtful, and he would just look at the data, and he said, among his many pithy quotes in his very fat books, uh, looking at data to see what it seems to say. So he's very much about looking to data. He was that guy who would say, why do you have so many significant digits in your numbers? Which is what I'm always saying to students still. And I always think of Tukey when I say that. But he's really about looking at your data. Look at it. Look at your data. Don't just do stuff. Look at it. And I'm always saying that to my students, annoying them. It's the first step before confirmatory techniques. It's exploring thinking about what's there, and you don't know exactly what you are going to do. Testing hypotheses, getting to know the lay of the land. It can be detective work. There's this great uh, data and analyst algorithm designer named Al Inselberg, who has a great paper about data detective, which I have my students read, uh, which is trying to not have assumptions about what's there and figure out what might be there in your data. Of course, you get into dangerous territory because the statisticians say you're on a fishing expedition. So how do you do this without being on a fishing expedition and just find noise in the data? And, and that's an unsolved problem, quandary question. So uh, the, the, the difficulty here is that you talk this way, and then the statisticians say you're just going to find noise in the data. So the bottom line is, though, that this is not well understood. And that's why this is a research question in my mind is what is this now? We have these tools, we have this data, it's not well understood exactly what is exploratory data analysis and how to do it, which is why I'm doing research on it. Why do it? Well, sometimes you want to optimize a function. So Al Inselberg has this great example of they, you have a problem, you have a factory, you're going to make light bulbs. This is a big deal right now. People are trying to make cheap as possible light bulbs, LEDs, say, in his example, it was before LEDs. And there's manufacturing constraints. If you, if you want to make the, LED, the light bulb cheap, then you know, what materials do you make so that when you, in the manufacturing process, not too many of them break, there's a lot of constraints that you have to make. You want to use the materials that aren't too toxic. So how do you settle the parameters so that the pro you can make a lot of bulbs and they're not too expensive and they don't break? And so he sets this up as a visualization problem with a lot of constraints. Having the human try to do the optimization rather than feeding it into an algorithm, you might be able to explore the space more e efficiently and effectively. 
create a narrative, tell a story. So there's great examples in this book by Cairo, Roberto Cairo, about how to do EDA to tell a story. Uh, plan a strategy, there's a lot of interest in, in how to make a strategy to solve a problem. Monitor a situation, people that are looking at fraud detection, looking for causal relationships. There's another reason to do EDA, what is causing this disease? You know, wh why, is, why is SARS happening? Why is Ebola happening? Solve crime, a lot of interest in that. Okay, what do we do when we do EDA? And I can have a laundry list. We do overviews. We do, we get to know the data. We look for trends. We look for tendencies. We make discoveries. We find anomalies, outliers, errors. We formulate and explore hypotheses. We can refute them. We can undermine them. Um, you can make errors too, though. So that's a problem. There's a lot of challenges, though. It's really time intensive. It's really ad hoc, it's not systematic right now. You don't know when you're done, you don't know if you're wrong, you don't know if you're missing things, you don't know if you're fooling yourself, and it's really unfriendly to beginners. So, I've taught EDA pretty much, I'd say every year that I have taught Infobis, and I can't claim that it went that well in the past until this year, last year. I'd say last year is the first time it was successful for most students. So, and it's partly because I changed my teaching style last year. <coughs> and now to this year. So, first of all, it's an attitude and a skill. So I realized after doing my objectively evaluated visualization assignment, students were in the objectively, well, we also did this narrative thing, but students were still in this mindset, and I had to be sure to get them out of that mindset. So I noticed in the past that they were gonna do the same thing on this assignment they'd done on the other assignment, which makes sense. And I had to be sure I'd shifted their minds to this new way of thinking. So, in this new teaching method, it's very interactive, very uh, activity-centered, so the students don't just read something and come to lecture and do an assignment after every three weeks and get feedback very infrequently. It's very, very active, where they do an activity before every class, they do activities in the class, they, they're constantly coding and designing and getting feedback. It's very, very active. And so they also can study and comment on other students' work frequently and get feedback. So what happened uh, this time was that I had them look at some other previous EDA assignments and write just a simple paragraph on two of them. And then I went and looked at their paragraphs. And the main thing I was looking for was, did you misunderstand what I wanted you to do? And if so, I corrected you. And that made a huge difference. So the students actually then understood what EDA was about, and I corrected a lot of people from going the wrong way. And so then, uh, the next step was to do it yourself, and I supplied some well-structured data sets so people didn't spend a lot of time looking for a data set, which is another pitfall of assignments like this, although they were allowed to also get their own data set, which some of them did spend a lot of time on, but some with some good outcomes. And then I had certain readings that were very good for doing EDA, and we will use Tableau, which uh, I think is a pretty good tool, although there's a lot of difficulties with Tableau too. And then I demonstrated Tableau actually on the objectively assessed uh, assignment. Okay, and so on. So I wanna show an example of what one of the students did. So one student named Faye Eep did this really amazing analysis of a BART strike. So for those of you from out of town, BART is our, Bay Area rapid, our rapid transit system and they threatened to do a strike over the 4th of July weekend, their week, and they did do a strike. And there's a lot of controversy around this, and people were saying, oh, the BART workers are overpaid, they have all this overtime, there's all these claims about the workers. So she d decided to investigate this, and there was actually a bunch of data put together. Um, and so my assignment was, you had to formulate, oh, I don't have that. Oh, the assignment was select a data set, formulate hypotheses, Explore those hypotheses, let the data determine next steps, verify or refute the hypotheses, reformulate or formulate new ones, and create dashboards summarizing the results for each. So you, you're supposed to formulate hypothesis and then verify or refute the hypothesis <coughs> with the tool. And that gives the structure to it. If you don't find evidence, then discard the hypothesis, but see if the data has led you to something else. And so she starts with these well-formed questions. That's what you're supposed to do. 
So the first question was, do union workers make more money than non-union workers, like a lot of people were claiming? And she actually found the answer was no. She made this very nice dashboard uh, where one color of blue is the union workers, the other is the non-union. She then sorted them actually by the salary range, and she saw actually the non-union workers are that's at the cyan here, and the union workers are the dark blue, and actually the non-union workers are making a lot more money. And then she also organized it by organization. She found out all this other stuff. And this led her to another hypothesis, uh, which is, is BART management heavy? It actually turned out, no, that answer was also no, though, because people were saying, oh, it's all the management. And actually, most people were rank and file workers. And I can't go into all the details. There's a lot of fascinating stuff in here. That learned, led to another thing. OK, what about overtime? This is a claim about overtime. Do union workers earn a lot of overtime pay? The answer was no, except for transportation operations, but they have low base pay. However, there's some interesting outliers among the non-union workers. So then she found certain non-union workers had these enormous overtime pay, like these huge outliers in uh, overtime pay. Like, what is going on with that? And so she investigated further uh, what is going on in the finance department. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And she found this. Roberta Collier's base pay is 33971 but other time pay was almost $300,000. <laughs> and, um, and she looked at that in more detail. She kind of left it there. I actually looked this up. I'm re like reading the assignment, so like I'm searching the news. And actually, it turned out that it had been investigated. And it actually wasn't really, there's another one too. It turned out like she'd massed 80 weeks of onions vacation and sick time in 20, 20 years. So actually, it was innocuous. But anyway, so, so it was really cool. And she actually found all this other stuff. So it turned out all the things everybody was upset about were not true, but these other interesting things were true. And she did it with, uh, with this data. So she put a lot of data sets together. But it's just really awesome. And I don't have time to go and do this other really cool one about City of Oakland data, which then, uh, because I read all the students' assignment, I found some correlations with San Francisco City data about, ba well, basically, um, <laughs> this, it turns out Oakland has this really good, like, 311 sort of thing. And basically, if you live in, West, if you want to dump a mattress in Oakland, you dump it in West Oakland, and it gets cleaned up quickly. But if somebody dumps a mattress somewhere where they don't dump mattresses, it doesn't get picked up very quickly. And the same thing happens in San Francisco. If you put graffiti where they don't normally do graffiti, it doesn't get cleaned up quickly. But if you do graffiti where it normally happens, it gets cleaned up quickly. That's what happens in city government. And I saw the similarity across two different cities by reading two different students' EDA assignments, which is pretty interesting. All right. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about just another really cool thing in summary was then in the final projects, which I'm showing a little um, my website where the course website where all the students' amazing final projects were, even though I didn't require it, and most of the students ended up incorporating EDA into their final projects, just as a matter of course, because they're like, of course I had to do EDA on my data in order to make sense of it. Um, and so then they did, even though it wasn't a requirement, which was really awesome. And so here's a really amazing wildfire and drought uh, project by, um, they have the students' names there. Okay, you, can, you can see them, um, but it's in small font. And I also have this amazing BART, another BART one. <laughs> Students are obsessed with BART, uh, where they did a Menard visualization style about who gets on and off which station. If you get on which one station, which one are you likely to get off of, which is fascinating. And they did EDA on male versus female riders. It turns out a lot more women, that the colors are flipped from what you'd expect, a lot more women than men ride BART, and they were, they were able to put it in a tree map here. And they did EDA, and they discovered that relation just by doing EDA. They weren't looking for that, but they found it. Uh, and that's something I don't think that's ever been reported. Well, I haven't seen it. Maybe it's been reported. All right. So the thing I actually really want to talk about, and I'm taking too much time, is the future directions. Because I, I feel like I could teach EDA a lot better than I currently am. And so we decided to have a research seminar on how to do it better. And there's about eight students in the class, and plus Sarah, the PhD student. But what we found is, so the first thing we did was we just did EDA on similar data sets to get um, each individually and combine them to see if there were commonalities. And we found that people did things radically differently and also made a bunch of mistakes. So for example, Sarah got a bunch of SCC flight data. And this is what Tableau looks like when you start. You get all of these variables. And they're in a column here, measures and dimensions, and sort of subtle difference there. And this is how many, very, how many items there are, if you just say how many items are there. Where do you start? It's a lot of stuff. That's part of the problem. So uh, one of the students, 
Poussin did this amazing, and we had people write up their process. He did this amazingly detailed, meticulous analysis. This is his uh, uh, list of what he did, his diary of what he did, of all the dimensions. He studied them carefully. He, this is what, like what I did. I studied these dimensions carefully, and I looked at them in great detail, and then he did this hypothesis formulation, because all, all the students had to have taken my class, prepared the tool, started the analysis, and he did this cool analysis. But what he did not notice is what this other student points out, uh, Anna Swigert points out, that this was one month of SCC data, the month of 9-11. Mm -hmm. And he never noticed that it was just that one month. So his analysis didn't, just didn't take that slice on the data. Where Anna shows here, this is delays, that there was no takeoffs and landings in that you know, several day period. So that was really uh, mind blowing to students that even though Hassan was so meticulous, he did not notice that there was this particular month out of this data set. We also looked at the Florida presidential election data and a couple of the students did this together and they, there's overvotes and undervotes and they spent all this time looking around and finally they had to go look at Wikipedia and see what it meant and then they realized that was error data. And all the students did the Florida data and Sarah mapped out um, their actions in this giant graph and we could see that there was very little commonality in what they did. And in fact, here's a close up of the different starting state for the students and we made, we've been making these um, node link diagrams and you can see there's very little commonality uh, in what people did even though we've all been trained together. So one of the thing, contributions we've made is this uh, really nice taxonomy of actions adapted from Gox and Zhao from IBM. And uh, this is uh, mainly Hassan Jana's work. And then what we've done, Hassan then made this graph uh, of a high level from the taxonomy at a very high level of the actions. Then you can drill down to the second level, third level, and so on. And this is actually a really cool viewer uh, that Shivam Gola has been making from these taxonomies as well, um, which I have an interactive version of, but probably don't have time to show. And then uh, another project that students are doing is what I'm calling metadata landscaping, uh, following Steve Pugh's article on exploratory <coughs> vistas. We have three projects on how to get a feeling for the metadata first to counter that problem that Hassan had and others had of not understanding what's in the collection before they start. So this is a really great interface that Ian McFarland and Anna Swigert are doing to give you an overview of the variables before you start visually. And what they're doing is say, select variables and add them to the question that you have before you start. And, s and try to ask yourself, can you answer the question that you have with this data set? So for example, this is Oakland City data, say, say your question is, does the city spend most of its budget on public safety? And now what you do is you select vi some variables like department, and amount and division. And it's going to show you the profiles and then you're going to answer yes or no, can, this can you answer the question with this data set? So it's forcing you to think about your data before you start, which is really awesome. And Hassan is making this visual meta summary of the data shape. So this is a Titanic data where it's showing you the frequency of the different values for the data and a sort of a spectrum of from beginning to end how, where these occur. So there's, um, this is female and that's male, and so the first you know, seven, say, are male, then a couple female, then male, and so on, to give you an overview of the distribution of the data. So he's doing different variations of this idea. This is more of the Titanic data for age. This is a distribution of the age in different ways, so that you can, again, so he will never be fooled by that gap again that he saw in the, in the, um, in the FCC data. And he's got a lot of ideas here. It's really awesome. There's related projects out there on data cleaning, data overviews, different ways to explore a data set. One that I think is really cool is this crowdsourcing research idea that's out there. Uh, it's not, there's not really a person associated with it, but these people are trying to uh, combat this problem with uh, different people do research in different ways, like we saw in our class. And so they had different people answer, different research teams, esteemed research teams attack the problem are soccer referees more likely to give red cards to dark skin tone players than light skin tone players? So they were given the same research question and the same data set, and they were all to analyze this data to the very best of their ability and report on their techniques. And 
here's the results. This is the really cool thing about this project is all of the information is on this wiki, and you can go to it and see the results, see all the web, all the files, and so on. So this is a depiction of the result and the technique that each team used, and this is a spreadsheet of what the teams found. The good news is that for the main hypothesis, RQ1, they pretty much agreed, except, well, some of the teams didn't. They gave a rating five to one. I guess they didn't all agree. But you can see how they vary their analysis. So we're trying to get a handle on how do people differ in how they do data analysis. I think this is super exciting that this is going on. So we can really understand how does data analysis differ. So uh, I think there's gonna be more of this and it's something we need. So my closing thoughts are that EDA has gained great momentum due to the availability of computing speed and new tools and new data, but our understanding has not kept pace. And, and so guidelines and guide tools are needed to help everyone learn how to do it better. And courses are a good way to help figure this out. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll hand over here. No. Actually, very fast. M more than a question is a quick comment. Uh, these are great tools, and my experience is that they're very dangerous. You know, I witnessed in a uh, project of a large car manufacturer that was trying to figure it out, little, pattern of uh, uh, cost for trucks and they figured out something was wrong and the uh, b uh, country manager was not very happy about it. So you could discover something that people don't want to share. So maybe that's an interesting also research issue to see how can you actually use this tool in, in the context of an enterprise where people, data transparency, they sometimes don't want to have it. Well, I mean, it was in today's paper about that poor G GM and engineer who ended up Hide, you know, buying, getting the new part for the ignition switch under the hood, so to speak, um, because he knew the existing one didn't work, and so he had a hidden part number, and people died. And yeah, I mean, organizations just inherently have problems with that. I mean, I think this idea of having, if an organization really doesn't want to make errors, having different groups analyze the data and show their results might be a good way to sort of take the pressure off any one group, you know, could be a way to help with that sort of thing. Okay, last question right here. So one of the things we talk a lot about at Wells Fargo is, you know, doing this kind of, in a business context, doing this kind of work, um, doing interesting and cool analytics is great, but it has to ultimately not only drive a decision, but drive some value. And otherwise, you've done something really beautiful and you can sit back and admire it, but it hasn't actually taken root into something. And so that's why I always have an issue. I think dashboards are useful. They share information to people who need it, but you have to be careful about how you're helping people drive decisions and value and action from them. So I'm just wondering, is that last part of that value chain something you help students think about? Because on dashboards, I always say, please circle a number for me. <laughs> you know, What's the one thing I should be paying attention to on the dashboard today? or what's the change in the trend, or if there's nothing, just tell me that, because then I won't spend five minutes trying to figure it out. So I'm just curious about that last part of the value chain in terms of readying students to work in those sorts of environments. Well, I think anything that gets trendy gets abused, and people just do it to look cool, and that's always a problem. Uh, so I think the best thing is to have people only do things that are, that are truly useful, and unfortunately, you know, big data became popular, became a term, and you know, it's overused too. So um, that is just always going to happen in business. Everybody jumps on the bandwagon and uses things inappropriately. So our students get taught how to use things appropriately. Yeah, always. Uh, I, I, you know, I think there's not. It's not true everywhere about everything. So yes, we put usability first. I mean, I think like the example I gave about the objectively evaluated. Uh, visualization assignment where people had to be able to answer the questions is a really great example of that, right? It was, if, you, if, if the person cannot answer the question about, I mean, I even used a business example there, how many, you know, 
you know, which month, uh, you know, which month is the one where the profits were down, uh, then it's not a good design, and that gives a more insight. I also think the example I gave with the, you know, the difference between a, a chemical formula that's written in text versus one where you see the structure is very compelling, right? It's the difference between an error and not an error. I think that would matter to Wells Fargo. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.